In this lecture, we will discuss pulmonary nuclear medicine. First, we'll talk about pulmonary embolism, which is the number one indication for a VQ scan. Then we'll talk a little bit about anatomy and physiology, radiopharmaceuticals and their localization, indications and imaging protocols, interpretation criteria, and a few cases. So first, general information. PE is fairly prevalent in our hospitalized patients. And if we look at um, all the hospitalized patients between 1979 and 1999, 0.4% of these patients actually had PE. It ends up being about 600,000 cases a year in the U.S. And um, then 65 to 90% of these uh, PE arise from thrombi in the deep venous system of the lower extremities. It's important to diagnose pulmonary embolism quickly um, because the mortality rate is high, um, approximately 30% without treatment. That falls dramatically to two to 8% once patients are treated. We're all aware of the risk factors, mobilization, surgery, um, stroke, paresis, or paralysis, history of v prior uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, malignancy, smoking history, Etc. Genetic predisposition is something we should also keep in mind. Factor V life mutation is fairly common, and if we have increased factor VIII, um, we can uh, also identify um, some genetic predisposition there, as well as protein C and S deficiencies. Um, those proteins are uh, involved in breaking down clots. So, just a reminder <laughs> of our clotting cascade may bring back bad memories, I don't know. Um, now, symptoms. Uh, the most common symptom, of course, is dyspnea, and um, that's followed by chest pain, cough, uh, thigh pain, um, or swelling, and wheezing. Cough and wheezing don't necessarily come to mind as readily as some of the other symptoms here, um, but uh, good to keep an open mind when we're evaluating these patients. Signs, of course, can be things like tachypnea, which is most common, tachycardia, rails, decreased breath sounds, etc. The D-dimer is often drawn in the emergency department. Um, we know that its negative predictive value is very high, which is great, um, but the sensitivity is also very high. Specificity is unfortunately low. Um, and we also shouldn't be drawing D-dimers in patients who have um, things like recent surgery or trauma or burns. Dr. Wells out of Canada came up with a pretest probability calculator um, here that uh, helps us to understand if, if we have a low, moderate, or high likelihood of um, uh, PE in patients. We can add in the D dimer and uh, have an even better understanding of that. A chest radiograph. A chest radiograph is essential before a VQ scan. It's preferred if it can be within 24 hours or whenever they have had um, their change in respiratory status. Um, it's needed for interpretation with some of our interpretive criteria that we'll go on over later. Um, and it might reveal the case uh, or the cause of dys dyspnea, things like a pneumothorax, if the patient's getting CHF or what have you. Anatomy. The lungs, of course, are covered by pleura, uh, separated by the mediastinum uh, and the abdominal cavity. In the right lung, we have the upper, middle, and lower lobe, and in the left lung, the upper and lower lobe. These, of course, um, are further divided um, into our bronchial tree, and then uh, we have bronchopulmonary segments, which mirror these. So um, in our... Um, a PE diagnosis for VQ, we need to see things that have a segmental distribution when we're looking at our um, perfusion images. If they're non-segmental, they're not a problem. Blood supply, of course, we know about this as well. Uh, we have the pulmonary artery that leads to the lobar artery and segmental artery, and then so on and so, so forth until we get to the uh, capillaries, which are affiliated with the alveoli. 
physiology, um, we of course know that the alveolus is the um, functional unit of the respiratory system uh, and gas exchange. We know that uh, we release carbon dioxide and uh, um, uh, welcome in oxygen in that area as well. Adults have 250 to 300 million alveoli. Keep that my, number in mind uh, when we talk about MAA and how it's distributed later. I will say also that um, the lung has the um, uh, function as a filter as well. We don't talk so much about that, but it's important. Um, indications. The ventilation and perfusion study uh, for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism uh, is, of course, our number one indication. We can also estimate regional uh, perfusion and predict a postoperative pulmonary function after a lobectomy or pneumonectomy. We'll talk about some other uh, indications a little bit later. But first, radiopharmaceuticals. So this is a photomicrograph uh, of the MAA particles. They're kind of irregular looking and they can clump. Um, the particle size is about five to 100 microns. The majority of these are gonna be about 10 to 30 microns. Um, and the number of particles that we give are 200 to 500. So quite a bit um, lower than the number of alveoli um, that we have. The way this works um, is capillary blockade. So these particles will lodge in the precapillary arterioles of the um, uh, just before the alveolar capillaries. And um, then we're able to um, kind of get a feel for the perfusion based on causing these microemboli. Um, the particles themselves are fairly malleable um, and they will eventually go away. The physical half-life of um, uh, Technetium 99M, of course, is six hours. The biological half-life with this particular radiopharmaceutical and how it's distributed is about two to four hours. Um, the dose that we give our patients is three to five millicuries. And um, we can also calculate the megabecquerels if we were so inclined by multiplying by 37. And the critical um, organ for this um, perfusion agent is the lung which makes sense, of course. So when we are um, injecting these patients, it's very important that they be supine. Uh, remember that when patients sit up, the perfusion goes to the bases of the lungs. Um, there's an effect of gravity there. Um, so when we have patients supine, we minifi minimize that perfusion gradient, and um, then we won't get artifactually reduced um, perfusion to the upper lung fields. We'd also like the patient to be quietly uh, respiring um, if possible. And uh, we like a peripheral vein um, also if possible. We inject slowly and um, then the injective volume is at least one to two milliliters. And then we flush um, and we never withdraw uh, when we're injecting to a patient. Uh, and we always remember to agitate the syringe or shake it up a bit um, to minimize the effect of um, clumping and things like that, which can cause so-called hot clots. And if you remember from Metlar, this is the, um, the figure that's used there to describe that. So you can see these um, areas of increased activity, which are um, related to improper um, uh, injection technique. We have a few precautions, uh, things like pulmonary hypertension, because these patients have a limited pulmonary vascular reserve. We want to ensure that um, the uh, dose is a little bit uh, lower as far as the particles are concerned. Uh, we also want to um, ensure that we're not a, as a including as many um, capillaries because we might have an acute exacerbation of the condition, sort of theoretical. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that for our right to left shunt patients, um, where we would see uh, immediate renal activity or um, brain activity, that we're not giving as many particles there because we don't wanna clot um, in those um, end organs. Um, so we can actually see a variety of end organs sometimes in these patients with right to left shunts. Um, the brain is the most specific um, uh, one. So if there's a concern for a right to left shunt, you definitely wanna get a view of the brain, um, but you can even see organs such as the heart, uh, kidneys, um, and you know, a variety of others. Um, Rarely um, you're going to see um, the heart 
Um, for these patients, we like to give half the number of particles. So pulmonary hypertension, right to left shunt, half the particles. Um, you can also just give half the dose in general. Uh, and for pregnant females, we lower the administered activity um, because we want to reduce the radiation dose. Um, so um, most places will give a one millicury um, dose and um, they may only do perfusion and we will do a longer scan time to get more counts over time um, and since the count rate is going to be much lower um, since they're not re um, receiving the same amount of activity. So this is an example of a right to left shunt. Uh, we can actually quantify the percent shunt uh, if we do a whole body image and then select regions of interest, etc. Our ventilation agents are xenon-133 gas. Uh, this would be a half-life of 5.3 days, an energy of 81 um, kilo electron volts. And this low energy can have um, associated soft tissue attenuation. The dose is generally going to be 10 to 20 millicuries and the critical organ is the trachea. So there's a few different phases of the um, ventilation for um, Xenon-133. The first, breathe in and ask the patient to hold their breath as long as they can for hopefully about 20 seconds, which is sometimes hard for these patients who are short of breath. And um, this will help us to detect uh, ventilation defects. And then um, the equilibrium where the patient is breathing both Xenon and air. And then finally wash out, the xenon machine is stopped. There's not as much pressure when the patient is breathing against it. And um, we're, we reassure the patient that oxygen is flowing in at the same time, um, but sometimes it can be a little anxiety provoking since it feels like they're breathing against some pressure. Um, for the washout phase though, that um, pressure feeling stops and um, then they're able to um, give us information on the images at that setting if there would be um, air trapping and things like that. Krypton 81M is a, um, another gas type of ventilation agent that we have. Um, it has really nice uh, energy and um, there's no um, beta associated with this at all. It's really preferred for pediatric patients. Um, it is very expensive, so um, it's not often used. Another agent that we have is uh, radio-labeled aerosol, uh, Technetium 99M DTPA. The half-life here is six hours. Principal energy, 140 keV, just like with any Technetium 99M um, uh, uh, radio pharmaceutical. The dose here is gonna be about 30 millicuries, but really only about one to two millicuries actually make it into the bronchi and the lungs themselves. So um, this, uh, you know, delivered dose is probably more on the order of one to two millicuries. The nice thing about this is instead of doing um, just quick images uh, for a few minutes, this is going to be able to be done in all projections. Um, of course, this will be done before the perfusion imaging uh, for all of our ventilation agents if we can. And um, uh, because it will be overshadowed by the um, Technetium 99M MAA activity, um, However, we do sometimes see a little bit of shine through of activity in central deposition of the airways, especially in patients with COPD. The halftime clearance, um, it can be variable depending on if the patient is a smoker or a non-smoker. For all of our ventilation agents, uh, we're basically localizing a um, uh, compartment. So um, we're putting gas into a compartment or aerosol into a compartment. So the, the radiopharmaceutical localization pattern is called compartmental localization. Ventilation agents, um, there's some advantages of radio labeled aerosols. Um, we don't need to have a negative pressure room for our gas. We need a negative pressure room to keep the gas inside the room and not have it float into the um, uh, uh, waiting area or reading room or what have you. Um, but uh, um, just kind of nice thing to not need if you can help it. Um, we also have the ideal energy, imaging energy with Technetium 99M and a small amount of activity is delivered with the radio labeled aerosol. <laughs>
So indications and imaging protocols. Um, we already alluded to some of the indications, but um, pulmonary embolism, of course, is by far and away our most common um, use of VQ. We can also uh, evaluate the cause of pulmonary hypertension, which can be pulmonary embolism. Um, we can document the degree of pulmonary embolism resolution. We can quantify uh, perfusion before pulmonary surgery for lung cancers or prior to transplant. We can also evaluate lung transplants, congenital perfusion abnormalities, um, and uh, evaluate chronic pulmonary uh, parenchymal disorders like cystic fibrosis. Plain RVQ um, is generally performed with a dual-headed gamma camera. We um, do these um, so that we can get two pictures at once. So um, they're 180 degrees from each other. Uh, the anterior and posterior images are usually acquired together. LAO and R RPO, LA or RAO and LPO, and uh, laterals are performed. So um, this uh, technique can also be done with um, well, not this technique, but uh, you can also acquire with a single-headed gamma camera, but the imaging will take twice as long uh, because you're not getting two images at a time. Each image um, takes between two and five minutes or so, um, it, and it also is very dependent on the patient body habitus um, because that can affect the count rate. Some of the um, gamma rays may be attenuated by uh, a lot of soft tissue, and so in the event that the patient is larger, um, you can expect that the uh, images will probably take a little bit longer as well. Sometimes we um, also can uh, only put the patient on a stretcher if they're particularly large. Um, and uh, in that setting, we may get unlimited views um, and we'll do the best that we can. Um, so that, that is also a possibility as well. And some uh, institutions also have um, portable cameras where they can get um, just an anterior and um, some anterior obliques and lateral views, hopefully, um, if the patient is on the floor. And um, if that's the case, then we have a sort of limited um, view um, perfusion imaging that we can look at um, and compare with uh, if, if there's an ECT recently or a chest X-ray to kind of uh, interpret the scan. SPECT VQ is uh, another technique. Um, a SPECT is a single photon emission computed tomography. And uh, that's basically sort of the reverse of a CT, if you will. Um, you're, instead of putting uh, electrons through the patient, um, uh, you are getting um, gamma rays coming uh, through um, the patient to the camera. And uh, this is a 3D image of. Um, the perfusion of the, the lung um, or ventilation as well. So uh, SPECT VQ is more sensitive than planar VQ. Um, some have suggested that this is a drawback um, because, because the lung is a filter and um, we all probably throw a few uh, clots at the end of the day after working in a reading room. Um, the uh, SPECT perfusion can also be performed in conjunction with the SPECT CT. Um, and um, then we can also do um, DTPA uh, ventilation if we would like. Um, one of the other agents that's uh, available in other countries called Technogas is much preferred to DTPA because it doesn't clump um, and it's, uh, it's beautiful. So hopefully someday in the United States we'll also have Technogas. And then if we are performing SPECT VQ, we will be able to do it a little bit better interpretation criteria. So when we are um, looking at perfusion defects, um, we need to know the size of a defect. So first we look at um, a, a large segmental defect um, that will occupy um, greater than or equal to 75% of a segment. Um, then we can have a moderate segment between 25 and 75% of a segment and then um, a small segmental defect will occupy less than or equal to 25% of a segment. Two moderate segments will equal a large segment and two small segments will be subsegmental or, or small segmental defects will be subsegmental defects. <laughs> 
So the PIOPED study was the study that gave us um, the uh, probability system. Uh, and sometimes that can be a little bit um, difficult uh, for our clinical colleagues to um, understand, but there is a way that we can put the clinical and the um, scan probability together to give a final probability. Uh, and still other places are now interpreting these as PE present or PE absent or um, uh, you know, non-diagnostic. Uh, and that that sort of um, interpretation criteria is probably where we need to be going, just throwing in my opinion. But um, the uh, exams that we have these days uh, are mostly asking about the probability system. So it's important that you know about that. Um, so a high probability basically means that there's a 80% or higher chance of pulmonary embolism. Practically, a high probability um, result means the patient has PE. This is going to be two large wedge-shaped pleural-based um, defects with associated normal perfusion. And this uh, overall is very specific. Um, but again, uh, the PIOPED study identified 80% or greater chance of PE. A low probability um, is a less than 20% chance of pulmonary embolism and uh, no um, moderate or large segmental defects, any number of um, small subsegmental um, defects. And we can also have non-segmental defects here. Um, the scan is not normal um, and it's neither intermediate or high, um, but practically a low probability with low clinical suspicion is no PE. Um, the PIOPED2 study gave us a very low probability category, which had a 10% um, or less chance of PE, um, and uh, um, also is practically speaking, no PE. Intermediate probability is where things get a little bit um, uh, difficult. This is a category where um, 20 to 80% chance of pulmonary embolism can be seen. Basically, we have one moderate to less than two large segmental defects. Um, and there's a few other things, uh, including a, a triple matched um, you know, uh, region in the lower lung zones or um, things that don't really fit into higher low category. Um, Etc. So I encourage you to review um, those. Uh, but uh, practically speaking, an intermediate probability means that we need another study, like a CTA. Um, and sometimes patients will need to be premedicated for that, etc. If there's a contrast allergy, which may be why we had done a VQ in the first place. Other um, systems of interpretation are the modified PIOPED criteria, PISAPED, Gestalt diagnosis. Um, also, uh, there's different methods of interpreting VQ, um, SPECT, et cetera. When we do interpret VQ SPECT, there's really no gold standard for interpretation criteria yet. But generally, if there's a mismatched defect that is a, a defect of perfusion with preserved ventilation, we call it positive. And um, if we look at all of the different um, criteria, um, PIOPED, modified PIOPED2, perfusion only, modified PIOPED2, and PISAPED, uh, we can see that there are a number of um, things to kind of keep in mind. So this, um, this article uh, from the Society of Nuclear Medicine encapsulates uh, well. Okay, now we'll do just a few cases. Um, and uh, the first case is a 23-year-old female with shortness of breath and history of DVT. You see a beautiful chest X-ray and a lovely um, ventilation. This is a ventilation that's performed with DTPA. You can see that um, we have a, a little bit of activity in um, the trachea and in the GI tract, and that's perfectly normal. Um, we can also sometimes see it in the mouth if we've gotten up that high. We have nice um, crisp borders here for um, a ventilation scan. We expect to see um, the cardiac um, shadow here, and this all looks beautiful. Her perfusion is likewise normal. Um, we see, again, um, area where we have um, the cardiac shadow and um, then everything else looks beautiful. Our second case, uh, so this would be a normal um, perfusion scan uh, or normal VQ scan. Um, and uh, that's always a nice thing to be able to say. 
Uh, second case is an 88-year-old female with a DVT following a hip fracture. And this is her chest radiograph. See her um, uh, heart looks quite enlarged. Um, ventilation here, we see a little bit of central clumping um, and maybe a few uh, ventilation defects uh, at the bases of the lungs. The perfusion matches well with um, the ventilation. If we go back, we can see um, there is kind of a scalloped appearance here at the right heart border, which we also see on the um, perfusion. Everything is matched. Um, this will be um, a very low uh, probability for PE because these are all non-segmental defects. Cardiomegaly counts as a non-segmental defect. We could also consider this a low probability if we were going with the standard PIOPED criteria. Oh man, this is a patient with um, obvious COPD um, and uh, um, the history is uh, COPD and dyspnea. And we see uh, chest x-ray, very characteristic of COPD. This is a ventilation study done with DTPA that is also um, common. Um, in appearance in patients with COPD, this kind of heterogeneous, um, clumpy looking uh, uh, appearance of um, the uh, aerosol getting within the lung. And then um, this patchy alterations and perfusion um, that we can see with our COPD patients. If we go back and forth between the ventilation and the perfusion, we see the perfusion overall looks better than the ventilation does. There's nothing that appears to be mismatched. This would be a low probability um, because this is a heterogeneous perfusion um, that we see quite commonly in our patients with COPD. All right, here's another patient with COPD um, prior to lung transplant. So this is a patient who um, we would uh, be evaluating, um, in this case, with um, xenon. For our um, COPD patients uh, with xenon, we can do an extended washout um, and get a little bit better feel of um, their lungs. In the wash-in images that we see here, we see um, a paucity of activity in the upper lung zones. Our equilibrium images, we're starting to see that activity get um, a little bit uh, more superior uh, in those lung zones. And then finally in washout, you see that there's, um, I think this is the extended washout, significant air trapping bilaterally. Um, so not looking beautiful from the ventilation point of view. And the perfusion also um, looks fairly poor. So we have um, reduced activity in the upper lung zones uh, matched with the ventilation findings, uh, very typical appearance of COPD. Um, and in this setting, we can also um, take the anterior and posterior images and um, uh, do uh, what's called a quant lung or quantification of perfusion and uh, do some calculations uh, to identify how much um, perfusion is in each lung if we were so inclined. Next, we have a 21-year-old female with chest pain and dyspnea. And here we have um, a ventilation that's performed um, in, with xenon. Um, no significant air trapping, um, nothing in the way that looks terrible. Uh, but we're seeing an entirely missing um, left lung. Um, we noticed on the chest radiograph here that the heart looks a little big. Um, it's not completely obvious on the chest radiograph, but this patient also had um, uh, Fontan um, proceeded, has Fontan circulation basically. And, and when we inject in an upper extremity, we'll often see um, only one lung. Um, it's better to inject in a lower extremity if you have the history. Um, and uh, um, the CTA can look the same way. We can only perfuse one lung based on how um, the plumbing is, so to speak. Um, and uh, uh, in uh, the way that we interpret this, if we have perfusion to only one lung, this is another intermediate probability examination. And um, uh, instead of uh, sending this patient to a CTA, um, the patient went on to the next day have an injection in the foot and um, the perfusion to the left lung was also normal. <laughs> 
Next, uh, we have a 54-year-old female with dyspnea and decreasing oxygen saturation. There's the radiograph, the anterior ventilation, and the posterior ventilation. So the ventilation shows us that um, uh, it, it looks fairly normal in the single breath image, equilibrium and washout don't show in much in the way of air trapping. And then on the perfusion images, we see um, a giant chunk missing in the right upper lung field and that corresponds to the right upper lobe. So um, this is a low bar mismatch, also meeting criteria for intermediate probability of pulmonary embolism effectively means we need another study. So when we're missing perfusion to a single lung or a lobe, um, there's a variety of different things that can cause that, not just PE. So we could have a mass that's compressing a vessel um, uh, and a variety of other things. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind, um, which is why it's intermediate and not high. The next patient is a 51-year-old male with respiratory failure. He's intubated in the ICU. Um, we were only able to get these three views, but we can see um, a variety of peripherally based large um, segmental um, perfusion defects that are seen in multiple projections. Um, and effectively, this is a high probability of PE. And then uh, we have a patient who is 73 years old, um, a female with dyspnea. And this is another set of images here that is very characteristic for high probability for pulmonary embolism. So we have nice normal ventilation uh, followed by uh, multiple peripherally based wedge shaped perfusion defects bilaterally, uh, which are mismatched from ventilation. Um, and again, typical for PE. So that's all I have for you today. Uh, take home points uh, for this lecture are really to know the mechanisms of localization of radiopharmaceuticals, know the indications and understand interpretive criteria. Take care.